The Holy Gospel for this day is taken from the first chapter of the Gospel according to St. Luke. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High God. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High God will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for her who was said to be barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray for the blessing of the Spirit to anoint the word. Come, Holy Spirit, and settle over us. Bring the Spirit to us, Lord, that our hearts would be open to hear what you would have us know. And let these words of you to our hearts change us. Amen. There was a young Jewish couple who just had their first child, it was a boy, and they were arguing over what to name the child and they couldn't come to a resolution and so they called the rabbi and asked him to come and help them decide what to name the child. The rabbi came and he asked what the problem was and the wife spoke and she said, well I want to name the baby after my father and he wants to name him after his father. And so the rabbi looked to the husband and said, what was your father's name? And the husband said, Joseph. And then he turned to the wife and said, what was your father's name? And she said, Joseph. <laughs> and the rabbi said, I'm confused. I don't understand what the problem is. And she spoke again. She said, my father was a good and righteous man, and his father was a thief. If we name him Joseph, how will we know which father he's named after? And the rabbi thought for a moment and said, go ahead and call him Joseph. When he grows up, if he's a thief or if he's a righteous man, you'll know which father he was named after. There's a way in which it's pretty scary because the truth of the matter is how we are is determined by whose we are and reveals whose we are. And that means that if you say you believe in Jesus Christ and you are a follower of this God and you are baptized as a child of God into this family, it should be revealed in your behavior and in your way of looking at the world and how you think about things. And anyone looking at you should be able to tell that automatically just by how you are. Because how you are reveals whose you are. And in fact, that's one of the real issues for Christian credibility in today's world. What the rest of the world <clears throat> calls hypocrisy is almost always related to that connection between what we say we are and who we actually are, how we actually live. And the second thing that's scary about that is sometimes the things that our God expects of us are nothing short of difficult. They may be countercultural. They might be things that the rest of the culture doesn't even think is right. And maybe more to the point, they're the sort of things that the ambient culture around us doesn't imagine that God would want us to do. I think that that's powerfully revealed in the story of Mary and her family, particularly in today's text. <clears throat> 
So what does it mean to say you follow this God, that you are named for this God, that you live as a child of this God? Well, the first thing that becomes obvious to me is that Mary and Joseph respond to God with radical obedience. That's kind of an unusual thought in our day and time. But they are radically obedient to God. Take Mary, for example. Mary would have been just a young girl. If she was like every other young woman at her time, she would have been 13 or 14 years old. She was engaged to an older man, which probably meant Joseph was in his 20s. They had to be old enough to support a family, so that was usually the sort of matchup they made. To be engaged was as binding as to be married, so if you wanted to break an engagement, you had to get a divorce just as if you were already married. <clears throat> and in that culture, the expected form would be that a young woman would stay in the home of her father and then go directly to the home of her husband so that she was constantly under the protection and really almost ownership of the man in her life. And in that culture, which had its tremendous strictness about such matters, if a woman messed up, she was really in trouble, even if it wasn't specifically her fault. So, for example, one of the most common punishments for rape was that the man had to marry the woman he'd raped without the prospect of a divorce. Look who's being punished for that, actually. And also, this was a world in which adultery was defined very differently than in our own day. In that world, under the strictest observance of the law, even speaking to a man who was not your husband was considered to be adulterous, and women could be punished for that. But certainly, a woman who's conceived, and it's not even the baby of the man that she's married to or betrothed to, that would be sort of the worst end of adultery. And there were prescribed punishments for adultery, stoning, as a matter of fact. Now, we know that by the time of Jesus, most adulteries didn't end up in stoning. They did if it was actually a sexual discretion. But most of them were punished by some other form of banishment, for example, divorce. Because divorce in that century was absolutely a family banishment. If a woman gets divorced, she's out on the street, which, by the way, her children are there too. So the children don't stay with the provider. They go with the mother. They're out on the street, and if the father will not take her back, which usually they don't, because after all, she has disgraced the family, it means that she's stuck on the street. A divorced woman was not technically allowed to beg, so she has only two options left to her. She can either die, along with her children, let her children die, or she can become a prostitute. So her options are not good. Look what the angel has just said to Mary. You're going to be pregnant. It's not your husband-to-be's baby. It's going to be the son of the divine God. But look what he's asking her to do. And when she agrees, she has actually placed herself in danger. Now take Joseph, for example. We specifically get told that Joseph was a righteous, righteous man. And that means that he's law observant. He keeps the Jewish law as best he can. Under Jewish law, he has to do something about Mary. He could have her stoned, but apparently he doesn't have that kind of a heart. He's a merciful man as well as a righteous man. And so he decides initially that he will divorce her. He must do that in order to satisfy the law. So imagine what God has now asked him to do give up keeping the law and be disgraced in front of everyone you know and spend the rest of your life having people make innuendos about the fact that you married this woman who carried a child who wasn't your child. Can you just imagine how tough that would be? That's a radical kind of um, discipleship, a radical kind of obedience. And I have to tell you that Mary makes her decision to agree to what God has asked her before she knows that God is going to talk to Joseph and intervene on her sake, before she knows that Joseph will be prepared to receive her, before she knows that Joseph is going to be willing to break the law in order to give her a life and a home and a family. Imagine the radical nature of that obedience. And I tell you this because I don't believe it is possible for us to imagine the level of faith and the magnitude of obedience that is represented in this young couple. Their willingness to do what God says for them to do is nothing short of magnificent. Magnificent. 
Can you put yourself in her place? Can you put yourself in Joseph's place? I think it's very, very difficult. How many of us have ever been asked to do something which would publicly disgrace us or put us in danger just for the sake of whatever God is doing in the world? I mean, we live in a culture in which we are embarrassed by the fact that we might have to invite somebody to come to church with us. It's not like we're going to lose our life for doing that. There are places where that happens, and people are much more invitational than we are. We live in a culture that is afraid to be left out of whatever is going on in the world because we're just too moral. You know, we don't want to do the kind of things that hurt another person. And so we worry about that. But how does that compare to with what Mary and Joseph have been invited to do for God? They are invited into a radical kind of obedience. We also get invited into a radical kind of obedience. And when we obey God, it may not always be culturally easy. It may not always be politically correct. And it certainly may not always be what the rest of the world thinks God would even be asking somebody to do. But when we respond, it represents the kind of life that transforms the world. Look what happened as a result of Mary and Joseph's willingness to be obedient. Secondly, the God who calls you by name is a God who wants to be in relationship, who wants connectedness. You see this also in Mary's family. I mean, God sends an angel to Zechariah to tell him that his wife, who has long been barren and is now past the time of childbearing, is going to have a baby. And God sends an angel to Mary to tell her that she's going to conceive and bear the child of God. And God sends a dream to Joseph in which Joseph is reassured, I want you to marry this girl. I'm going to stand with you in the midst of all this disgrace. And then later, um, God sends a star to the Magi so they know where to go. And a dream to tell them to leave by another route so that they don't go back to Herod and give away where the child is. <coughs> and God sends Joseph another dream and tells him to flee the country, get out of Dodge. Now just think about that. This is not a God who is remote. If you've been thinking that God isn't really involved in your life and God is somehow remote, you can just get rid of that idea. Because the hundreds and thousands of times in the scripture, we see a God who constantly comes and is in relationship and wants to connect with us and talks with us and shapes us and helps us and even sometimes tests us. This is the God of connection. Now, this isn't always comfortable for those of us who are ma raised in modern America because in the, 18, in the 18th century, there was a movement that swept through the colonies called deism. Deism is the idea that God is sort of like a watchmaker who winds up the clock and then just sets it on the shelf and goes away and lets it run down for itself. So God created, <clears throat> set everything in motion, and then just takes off and leaves it to fend for itself. <coughs> the luxury of deism is that you don't have to worry about what that God expects of you because that God is not around. But the problem is it's not scriptural. It's not at all the witness of the scripture. Because time after time after time, we find a God who is closely connected in loving relationships and sustains and supports the people. And we see it in our midst, and we see it in the whole history of how God has been with us from generation to generation. This is a God of connectedness who wants to be in relationship with us. And I want to say to you today that if you sometimes feel like you don't really want to be in relationship with other people in this group or in other places, know that our God is a God of relationship, and that's what grounds our relatedness to one another. That's where we find the hope and comfort and willingness to step out of our comfort zones and become encouragers and spiritual friends with each other. If that component is missing in your life, perhaps it is a, an issue of relatedness to God above everything else. Third, the God whose name we bear, who calls us into relationship, who wants to be in relationship, is a God who's trustworthy. Mary and Joseph knew that. 
Could you imagine them doing all those things that God wanted them to do if they didn't trust God? In fact, I think all obedience stems forth from a trusting relationship, and that's true in the midst of our human relationships as well. I cannot be obedient to someone that I do not trust to have my best interest in their heart. That's what God does, and that's what Mary and Joseph know. And that therefore means that we too are called to be trusting and trustworthy with one another because it is from that trust that our relationships grow and we become obedient to God together as a group. About 150 years ago, there was an interesting couple living in England, (coughs) Catherine and William Booth. They lived in rural England for the first part of their marriage, maybe about 10 years. And during that 10-year period of time, William just didn't know what to do with his life. He was just in a quandary. Everything he thought about, he just didn't know how God was going to use it. And he couldn't quite figure out how that was going to be of any importance. But the thing is, Catherine was a gifted Bible teacher. And she eventually got invited to come to London to preach. I think that's remarkable in that day. So they go to London together, and Catherine is preaching And William is kind of wondering what God is going to do in his life. And one night, late at night, he goes for a walk in the slum area of of London. And while he's out there, he notices that about every fifth building is a pub. And not only is every fifth building a pub, but when you walk into a pub, you notice that there are little stair steps up to the counters. And that's because any child who could climb that step and put money on the counter could drink gin or whatever it was that they wanted. There were no rules about age for drinking. And he came home that night and he said, Catherine, I think I've found my calling. It was as if God said to me, have you ever seen such misery? You will never see such misery any place else. And we are called to care for these people. Later that year, in 1865, they established the first Christian mission in the slums of London. And they did their work there. Their mission and goal was to be those who care for people that the rest of Christianity ignored or walked past or thought deserved what they were experiencing. That little organization began to grow. Today we know it as the Salvation Army. It has 3 million members in 91 countries. And yet today is one of the finest organizations for helping the poor and disenfranchised in our world. Which is why we have a kettle in our welcome center. For some years now, we've had a person in this congregation who has matched funds for anything that goes into that kettle because this congregation is a congregation that is committed to what God is committed to. And that's just one of hundreds of ways that you can plug in here to help affect the lives of those who are suffering in our midst. It might be to do something distant like that, just putting money in the jar or giving a contribution, or it might be going out and actually working and handing out food or dealing with the homeless people or putting yourself on the line for the sake of another person. We are the people called into that kind of relationship by a God that we can trust. It all stems from trusting that God will keep the promises that have been made. So look at your life and your dealings with this God. And know that God is always near, always connected. And that God can be trusted. And that sometimes you will be called into a radical kind of obedience that will make your little squirmy feet in the fire of our culture and that will be difficult, and that other people will even cast doubt whether or not it could be God calling you to do that. But proceed because God is trustworthy. How will you wear the name of Christ in your life?